I'm Alice Loxton and I present documentaries over on History Hit TV. If you're passionate about all things history, sign up to History Hit TV. It's like Netflix, but just for history. We've got hours of ad-free documentaries about all aspects of the past. You can get a huge discount from History Hit TV. Make sure you check out the details below and use the code ABSOLUTEHISTORY, all one word when you sign up. Now, on with the show. 200 years ago, there was a continent near the bottom of the world which not many people knew very much about. And below it, there was a funny island shaped like that, which even less people knew anything about. And down the bottom of that island, there was a tiny settlement which virtually nobody knew anything about at all. Must have been pretty uninteresting, mustn't it? Well, no, it wasn't, actually. Welcome to Hobart. Australia. Today, Hobart gets to showcase some of its more infamous characters. There's a tough-as-nails brothel madam who knew how to keep tabs on her girls. Under the mattresses, the bowls would tingle. <laughs> Australia's favourite royal and the building named for her that she never got to see. Woo! And some bad girls with an undeserved reputation. No, no, no. It didn't happen that way at all. <laughs> Our walk starts in the heart of town at Hobart's famous docks. First port of call for fishos, greenies and the occasional intrepid explorer. In the early 20th century, the only continent still unexplored was Antarctica. And as you can imagine, there was a huge amount of competition among the explorers to be the first to get across it. And in March 1912, a man came ashore right here, he rowed across in a little boat from his ship. And he didn't have a nice leather coat like I've got, and he didn't have a blue car either. What he did have was this. Look, I'll show you. He was wearing a reindeer coat. Who killed Kenny? Who was he? None other than Norway's Roald Amundsen, the first man to reach the South Pole. This is what he looks like in a reindeer skin coat, and this is what I look like. I can imagine the locals would have thought he looked pretty naff if he'd wandered the streets dressed like this. I certainly do. Actually, when he checked into Hadley's Orient Hotel, he wrote in his diary that he was treated like a tramp and given a miserable room. Pretty soon, this grizzled old sea dog was back among the genteel folk of Hobart, tramping the streets. Curious journalists, polar paparazzi if you like, kept trying to find out who he was and why he was there. But the first man to reach the South Pole had a higher authority to report to. Eventually, he reached his goal, the post office. And he sent a telegram to the King of Norway, which said, thanks for everything, mission accomplished, all well. Three days later, all around the globe, people knew he was a hero who had completed this amazing journey. But up until then, nobody in Tasmania had a clue who he was. They just thought he was some raggedy bloke. Well, everyone did, except one guy, Mr. Frank Bowden that was in charge of the telegrams at this post office. Amundsen is recognised as one of the key players in the heroic age of Antarctic exploration. Frank Bowden isn't, but I'm sure he was a real asset to the Hobart post office. I've just doubled back on myself. The post office is up there, because I want to go down Morrison Street in... Hang on. Hang on, keep rolling. We have a slight... a slight problem. Hi. Hello. Is there a problem? Yeah, you just have an expired meter. Uh, is it all right if these guys pay for me? Yep, that's fine. Oh, well, that's no really decent. Thank you. Cheers, mate. Thank you. Well, uh, it's a relief anyway. 
it does actually give me a chance to crowbar in another piece of history, which is that the very first parking meters to be installed in Australia were in Hobart. It was in 1955, and they were put in on April Fool's Day, which is quite appropriate, isn't it? And the mayor at the time was Mayor Park. Are you all right to uh, do these? Thanks. I'll uh, see you at the next location. It's not that I couldn't be bothered moving the car or that I think the crew's there just to do whatever I want. Although, come to think of it, no, it's just that I am on a walk. And besides, I have something more important to do. Like go to the pub. For purely historical reasons, of course. Cool, you took your time. Excuse me. Now, you remember I was talking about infamous characters. Well, one of the most infamous lived in here, which was formerly known as the Blue House. Why is this place called the Blue House? Because it was the scene of a great number of what are referred to here in the vernacular as blues. What's that mean? Or, or fights. Oh, fights. Because it was a pretty seedy place in many ways. But uh, it had a lot of characters here, and the biggest character was Ma Dwyer. Is this so, Ma Dwyer? And that's her. And um, She looks a bit like the young Princess Margaret. Yes, it's flattering <laughs> yeah. in her younger years. And she operated this place as uh, Hobart's major brothel oh. um, upstairs. And part of the entertainment, and to uh, keep an eye on her own business, I suppose, was that in the, the nine beds in the rooms in the brothels, she attached lengths of wire under the mattresses that went down through the, the ceiling at the bar and each one of the nine was attached to a bell, nine bells. And when the mattress was working, the bells would ring. And Ma knew if the girls went, then were working, I suppose. So but it was when, great entertainment. Yeah, when she was making a, a lot of money, it must have been quite a musical accompaniment down here. Indeed. Now, virtually every house that I've ever been involved in excavating, people have always said there are tunnels here. But it, it's always a myth. There never are, are there? Tony, right below us is a, an amazing tunnel. A tunnel? A oh, tunnel. let's have a look. Cool, it's a bit of a struggle getting down here, isn't it? On this way? Correct. So where are we now in relation to the pub upstairs? Well, we are below where we were sitting. This ah. is the pub cellar. In here? Down slightly to the left. Of course, cool, just... And then up, and there's your tunnel. A great big pile of earth here. Come on, have a look at this. Oh, I see it. I see it. It's through in there. Of course, like an old wooden lintel there, isn't there? Yes. It goes all the way across the road through a little park to the colony's first customs house, where in the cellar they stored imported rum. And allegedly, for years, in the late 1800s, uh, drinks were smuggled out of the customs house across here to the pub. Well, I know that normally these things are just a, a bit of a fantasy, but in this case, <laughs> we actually have got some proof on the other side of the road. Come on, this way. OK, so just somewhere over here. Yep, it's down here. See, this is where Mike and I were below there. And that is one end of the tunnel going in that direction. And over there is what used to be Customs House and is now Parliament House. Are you coming or what? At this point, I'm not sure what's more ridiculous. Following up yet another shaggy dog story about tunnels leading from the corridors of power to dens of iniquity, or the sight of a bloke my age jogging and trying not to spill a pint of Guinness at the same time. One day I might get a real job. Anyway. Look. Secret stairs. Secret tunnel. Now. I can't absolutely guarantee that that tunnel links to the tunnel by the pub, but I'd think so, wouldn't you? Time to get my breath back with a visit to Australia's oldest working theatre. 
The Theatre Royal in Campbell Street is a lovely bit of work that dates back to 1834. Mind you, it didn't have a particularly salubrious start. Can I have some lights, please? Thank you. This area used to be known as Wapping, and it was a pretty dodgy old place full of prostitutes and sailors and brothels, and the theatre itself was built between an abattoir and a tannery. So you can imagine what the stink would have been like. It must have been really difficult to attract a theatre-going audience here. Can I have stage lights, please? <laughs> Woo! <laughs> That's pretty good, isn't it? So, by the 1850s, they were still putting on shows here, but essentially they were cockfights and boxing matches, political rallies, that kind of thing. And over the next 80 or so years, things went from bad to worse until the stage was rotting, and backstage it was really cold, cockroaches crawling all over the place, a bit like a lot of the touring theatres I've spent most of my life in. But all that was transformed in 1948 when Laurence Olivier and Vivian Lee and the Old Vic Company came out here and immediately Olivier was besotted by this theatre and he persuaded the people of Tasmania to get behind their theatre and the government stumped up a lot of money and transformed it into this wonderful space that we have today. And there's a curious story about that that I will demonstrate for you. When they got together a royal tour of Australia for the elegant young Princess Elizabeth, they built this royal box here so she could come to Hobart and see a play at the Theatre Royal. But then her dad died and the tour was cancelled because she had to concentrate on being Queen. But I don't actually blame her for not coming here because when you sit in this royal box, you can't see what's happening on at least half the stage without standing up and craning your neck round in a very unregal manner. But nevertheless, because this is a royal box created especially for a princess, nobody has ever sat here since. Well, I am now, obviously, but uh, you know what I mean. On my way up to North Hobart now, I want to tell you about a London crim called Ike Solomon, supposedly the inspiration for the rascally Fagin in Dickens' Oliver Twist. When the law finally chucked him into Newgate Prison, he escaped and legged it to America. So, what was the Hobart connection? Well, his wife Anne was arrested too, and she was brought here in chains, and she brought her kids with her. And Ikey over in the States heard about this, and he set sail for Hobart, come in, and um, when he got here, he set up shop as a purveyor of stolen goods. And everyone knew who he was. He was a real character here. He made loads of money, but nobody could touch him because he hadn't committed a felony in Tasmania. And he managed to get his wife out of prison and she helped him in the shop and they did very nicely, thank you. Am I all right in here? Yes, so, yes. Thank you very much. And a year later, the English authorities sent out papers to say that he had to be arrested. So he was dragged back to England and he was tried, he was found guilty. And what was his punishment? He was sent back to Tasmania again, this time as a convict. And he served his time, came out again and set up business again. He was absolutely irrepressible. You got to pick a pocket, know what I mean? Ike's shop is long gone, but this building isn't. Obviously. Early last century, Hobart High School boasted a Hollywood heartthrob to be. And I'm going to introduce you to someone who was here with him. Hi, love. In the early 1920s, you played tennis with someone who went on to be very famous. Who was it? Errol Thompson Flynn. Who became the Hollywood Errol Flynn? Yes, the idol of America. Was he good looking? Oh, yes, a couple of the lady teachers, they were in love with him. <laughs> it was good to be with. And, uh, and, of course, he played a beautiful stroke of tennis. And how's this for a keepsake? Isla inherited one of Errol's old textbooks. As his name is written. Oh, it's here. It's right in the yes. first page, isn't it? Yes. Errol Thompson Flynn, Hobart State High. Mm. 
And there's your name, Isla. Oh, yes. Isla Crease. Uh -huh. Well, there you go. It's a wonderful thing to have. How old are you now, Isla? Um, I'm pushing 102. Well, Isla, I know you haven't played for some time, but if you fancy uh, a quick knock-up, I'd be happy to oblige. All right. Well, it's a bit too windy, I think, today. We'll probably put it off till tomorrow. All right, I'll come back and we'll play tomorrow. <laughs> That's a date, yes. Hobart High School was one of many schools the tearaway young Errol was politely asked to leave. Once a naughty boy, always a naughty boy, eh? It's funny, until I came to Hobart, I'd always assumed that Errol Flynn was an American. Yeah, 80 years ago, he was here playing tennis with Isla. I reckon I could take a couple of games off her, don't you? So, when I said a Hobart walk, I bet you didn't expect a polar explorer, an unused royal box, and a Hollywood heartthrob. Well, did you? And we're still only halfway. Coming back down the hill now into the city, this synagogue is very interesting. It's built in the Egyptian revival style, like an ancient tomb or something, and that is the oldest surviving synagogue in Australia. Not only that, but it's the only one in the world that has got benches for convicts, and that is very Hobart. Just down the road is a local landmark known as the Rivulet. It doesn't look like much now, but in early colonial days, it was to Hobart what the tank stream was to Sydney, a vital water supply. If you follow it south of the town, the cold, clear water tumbling down from nearby Mount Wellington transports you to another time. Here, you get a sense of what this place might have been like 200 years ago. Although, actually, it wouldn't have looked anything like this because it would have been surrounded by tanneries and all the other detritus of industrial life. So that by the time the rivulet got down into Hobart, it would have been stinking and putrid. Not a very cheery thought, I know. But then life in early Hobart was a struggle especially if you were unlucky enough to be banged up in my next stop. It was called the Female Factory, and it's where the women convicts were put when they arrived in Tasmania. It was really the female version of Port Arthur, which was a horrendous hellhole. And from the beginning, it was a whole complex of buildings. You had places for washing, for sleeping, for working, all surrounded by these incredibly high walls. And there were three classes of prisoner. Excuse me, are you on a tour? Yes. Could I borrow you just for a minute just to uh, do a demonstration of prisoners? Yeah, yeah. Is that all right? OK, there were three classes of prisoners, right? These were the C class. Could you bunch up here? This is the convict class. You were the lowest of the low, the depraved, the absolutely contemptible. And uh, you had a C sewn on your petticoats and you'd have them on your sleeve there, another C, so everybody knew how vile you were and you really didn't get much food at all. That's you lot. <laughs> then the, um, the next class, the probationary class... Oh, you're the guide, aren't yes. you? You know all this stuff, oh, yeah, don't definitely you? definitely, everything. <laughs> the pro probationary class didn't have the C on their petticoats, did no, they? No, they only had it on their arm. And you got better food? Yeah, a bit better, yeah. There's always hope, right? So <laughs> if you'd been a probationer for some time and you were good, then you could be an assigned <laughs> prisoner. Oh, you're very friendly, too. Uh, the assigned prisoners were allowed to go out of the prison and they could work for an employer outside who could feed them and clothe them, but they weren't allowed to give you any money. But it was much better than being a C-class or a P-class. Give us a big smile. Oh, <laughs> but we had to go and do housework. Oh, you did have to do housework, but it, it, even that was much better than what these poor souls had to go through. Anyway, um, thank you for that. You don't really get much of a picture, though, of what this place looked like from here. Up here, though... Lucy, this is a very convenient vantage point, isn't it? It is. We just have these stark walls, but actually from here you can begin to imagine how 
this is almost like a village. There are walls within walls. People are walled off so that they are not supposed to be able to have contact with each other. So here's the kitchen and the laundry. That's where the climb class is, where people are being punished. Over there is the probation class, and in the middle is the chapel. It must have been crazy. It must have been. These were open courtyards, and uh, so you could hear from one to the other. It would be incredibly noisy. Not to mention bone-chillingly cold in winter and baking hot in summer. This factory was little more than a prison, and like all prisons, it had its top dogs. I must tell you about one aspect of this place which really tickles me. Even though you were all so downtrodden, there were a group of you who were known as the flash mob because, essentially, you were really flash. You managed to make homemade jewellery, uh, homemade mob caps, and they terrorised everybody else. And they were being uh, lectured once by a reverend, and uh, this is what they did, which is the thing that I would love you to to recreate, if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> Tony, 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 yeah. this is wrong. This, no, 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 what? it didn't happen. It didn't happen that way at all. Oh. The flash mob were very stylish, as you say, yeah. and they just rejected the uh, messages that were being beamed to them by the authorities, work, behave, work, behave. They kept getting together and they drove the superintendent crazy. He said, they've been singing and dancing and making a noise. They were not like these women who look as though they just came in from milking the cows. And they would never have done anything like that. I think you made your point. <laughs> <laughs> this wouldn't be historically valid if we got no, these ladies to do this. No, Which is a tragedy no. for me. I thought we were going to get a great piece <laughs> of audience participation. You've, you've ruined it for me. I know, I know. Bye. See those words up there? It's just a bunch of rocks on the hillside, but... It's an ad that's been there for decades. It says Keen's Curry, and it's a direct link to the next thing we're going to have a look at, which is just down back towards the city. I'm just turning right out of Sandy Bay Road into Ashfield Street, and the bloke who owned the curry business in the late 1800s was called Horace Watson, and he lived over here in a big mansion called Barton Hall. But it's not the hall that interests me right now. It's the shed at the bottom of his garden. You might think that's the most boring thing in the whole world, but bear with me, because I think it's interesting. Anyway, um, if it was at the bottom of his lot, then uh, it could be that, couldn't it? I don't think it is. Watson, like so many rich Victorian men, was into all sorts of things. Shells, fossils, the latest technology, and the big new technology at the time was recording sound on wax cylinders, which he did a lot of. You see this, um, this great trumpet thing there? He's brushing away with it there. And that has, has got to be here, isn't it? He was doing his recordings right here. But what interests me is not him so much as the woman whose voice he's recording. This is her, Fanny Cochran Smith, an extraordinary Tasmanian Aboriginal who was taken from her parents as a child and forced into virtual slavery with a master who flogged her. Eventually, she married an ex-convict, started a boarding house and became an established community figure. But what really set her apart from everybody else was her voice, and it was that that Watson recorded in her original Aboriginal language. Here it comes. This wax cylinder recording of traditional song lines is the only known example of a lost language unique to the Tasmanian Aborigines. Watson, Fanny and her song are long gone. 
and Barton Hall doesn't exist anymore. In its place, there's this car park for a big supermarket, and over there, where the grand front of the hall would have been, is a burger joint for an international chain with a name that sounds vaguely Scottish, if you know what I mean. All that's left of this story is that shed. And that's exactly the kind of thing you're constantly confronted with when you do a walk like this. I have to hand it to Hobart. It really packs some variety into a whole day's walk. Sadly, that walk finishes here in historic Salamanca Place. All of its stories will have to wait for my next visit. And trust me, I will be back. I love this place. All right, I know that people say that folk from Hobart have got two heads and marry their sisters and that kind of stuff, but the reality is that it's sophisticated, it's vibrant, and yes, its history is tinged with unspeakable sadness, but today, it's all right if I join you. Thank you very much. It's got to be one of the best places in the world to live. That's one. I'd love one.